laser one. pointer if you got one. Yeah. Thanks for helping me. My pleasure. Uh, and then this is post-operatively. This is travel with a chronic sixth cranial nerve precis, and that's post-operative photos on the bottom row. Um, the differential diagnosis of sixth cranial nerve palsy in kids is brain tumor, brain tumor, brain tumor, or hydrocephalus, something going on that's intracranial. But also, post-viral, uh, is it really a, a you know, uh, an inflammatory process after a viral infection that causes the sixth cranial nerve palsy? Yeah, probably. But, you know, kids are always sick, right? So just by, I mean, if you study, do kids have sixth cranial nerve palsy after a viral infection? Well, they all do. There's so many viral infections in kids that I've, I've always thought, well, yeah, that's probably what's going on, but um, certainly never rely on that without an imaging study, okay? Um, and uh, trauma. Definitely is up there in kids. And uh, if they do have hydrocephalus from a mass or other intracranial disease, they often have other neurologic signs. Differentials, Duane syndrome, which we're going to talk about, just infantile esotropia, and you can't get a child to abduct their eye because of poor cooperation, um, and a few other things that I don't want to talk about in detail. Um, Here's a differential. Get an MR. Do a pediatric neurologic exam. Brief one. You can do it. You know you, you know how to do just the basics, but you can always refer them to a neurologist as well. Um, if it's idiopathic or post-viral, it tends to resolve over time. And we watch and wait, especially if a child is turning their head and still fusing and often it will resolve, but it often recurs during childhood. <coughs> it's an entity that we don't really understand. But these are kids whose immune system apparently is causing some post-viral inflammatory um, pathology at the peripheral sixth cranial nerve. And then if it's chronic, with sixth cranial nerve palsy, surgically you really have two choices. If the lateral has function, but it's reduced function, but it's not a dead muscle and doesn't pull at all. If it has some function, but the eye is still esotropic, a recess resect procedure will, will give a really nice result. But if the lateral rectus is dead and doesn't pull at all, then the only way to get abducting force on the eye, getting the eye to turn out away from the nose, is to transpose the vertical recti towards the lateral rectus and use the vertical recti to get an abducting force. And here's a pre-op photo. It's the left eye, and this is post-op. Oh, I apologize, it was bilateral on him. But much worse on the left compared to the right. Um, okay, so let's take a tangent. Remember I said, no one, you keep hearing this, sorry. No one wants to miss a tumor, right? So you're, you're you're in your pediatric ophthalmology clinic, you've done a fellowship, or maybe not. Maybe you're just on call. And you go to the ER at Primary Children's and there's a child with an esotropia. And you know, it looks like a comitant esotropia. It looks like abduction is, you know, pretty good. Okay. Um, and, uh, but do kids with acquired non-accommodative comitant esotropias ever have brain tumors? And the answer actually is yes. And they probably have subtle abduction deficits because of hydrocephalus, but you can't detect it. So how are you gonna know? Okay, how are you gonna know? Um, optic atrophy, nystagmus, those are the two main things, optic atrophy and nystagmus an absence of a family history of strabismus, okay? So esotropia, it tends to run in families, right? If you have a child whose cycloplegic refraction is plus one sphere in both eyes, no family history of strabismus, and, um, you know, you've, you've got a child with an esotropia, looks competent, not super cooperative, 
Don't miss a tumor, right? Look for optic atrophy, look for nystagmus. And I do get an MRI of kids who I feel like I can't get a really good exam to make sure that they have no abduction deficit. And if they have a hint of optic atrophy or are suspected at all, I, I go ahead and in absence of family history, I just scan them. Because if you don't, uh, those kids, the treatment is surgery. Okay. So if you don't, and there have been case series of this following scenario, you operate, they're undercorrected. You operate again, they're undercorrected. Then you scan them. Oops. And everyone, ever, you know, then, then there's less happiness in this world at that point. Uh, well, so not missing intracranial pathology with common to that's why we try to measure kids in side gazes in the clinic. Because incompetent esotropia due to an abduction deficit, you might pick up when you measure that you can't see when you do version testing. So if you can, you know, it depends on the child, their age, their level of cooperation. Okay. Mobius syndrome. Anyone know what that is? It's a combined sixth cranial nerve, bilateral sixth cranial nerve palsy, and bilateral seventh cranial nerve palsy can be associated with. Uh, systemic anomalies. Uh, just throwing it up there so that you recognize his face. That's typically what they look like. They can't smile. Uh, Duane syndrome. Oh dear. <coughs> Let's say you're, you finished your fellowship. You finally got that big paycheck. You're like, yes, I'm going to build a custom house but you're cheap with the electrical contractor and they miswire your house. And the light switch in the kitchen on the ground floor is turning the lights on and off in the upstairs bathroom. And your spouse is up there saying, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, that's a miswiring of your, your new house. Duane syndrome is a miswiring of the cranial nerves. It's a cranial disinnervation. okay? So what happens is these kids have hypoplasia of the sixth cranial nerve nucleus and absence or hypoplasia of the peripheral sixth cranial nerve. They have very poor, typically poor lateral rectus function. And the bizarre thing is the miswiring. This is so bizarre. The third cranial, the peripheral third cranial nerve innervates the lateral rectus as if the lateral is starving for innervation during development and a branch goes over there. It's really bizarre. So, not surprisingly, uh, this, this disease causes the lateral rectus and the medial rectus to contract at the same time. Isn't that weird? It's really strange, right? It doesn't make any sense unless you understand the abnormal anatomy of the peripheral third nerve sprouting an extra branch to the lateral rectus. And when you read about Duane syndrome, here's how you should think about it. That, that, Bilateral, uh, uh, rather, that simultaneous contraction of the medial and lateral rectus pulling the globe into the orbit, that unifies all of Duane syndrome. So you're going to read about type 1 and type 2 and type 3 and less abduction, less adduction. They're exotropic, they're esotropic, they have upshoots and downshoots. And you're just going to be like, okay, I just want to read about retina. <laughs> But, but this is easy, actually. It's the co-contraction of the lateral medial rectus that unifies all of Duane syndrome. And, you know, if you look at these kids, um, on a tech, uh, attempted adduction from the side, from here, you can see the, the apex of the cornea goes zoop, back into the orbit. So when you do peds and you see a kid with Duane syndrome, look at him from the side and have him follow your, you know, kids facing this way, right? Have them look that way and look at the right eye. You'll see the, 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 the globe actually goes back in the eye. I mean, we teach it that the palpebral fissure narrows. And, and of course that happens, that's easy, easy to see looking face on. But to really understand this, look, at the, look from the side. And then we're like, oh, okay. This unifies all of Duane syndrome. And all these classifications make a heck of a lot more sense. Um, 
A few muta mutations are known, have been isolated in a few families, but in general, uh, this is not uh, inherited, can be, they're reported families. Uh, so they're the types. Type 1, esotropia, type 2, exotropia, type 3, no strabismus. Okay, if you want to memorize it. But they all have co-contraction. They all have globe retraction on, on, attempt, on attempted adduction. And um, so this miswiring I talked about, an extra branch of the third nerve going to the lateral rectus. Well, how much innervation goes to the lateral rectus and how much innervation goes to the medial rectus? Well, that varies from patient to patient. And remember, there's a tug of war going on. Well, if the resting innervation of those two muscles favors the medial rectus, a child will be esotropic and they'll turn their head to point their eyes straight ahead. That's type one. What if the innervation is more to the lateral rectus than the medial rectus? Well, their eyes are going to be out, right? It's going to be an abduction. They're resting tonus. And so they want to use both eyes together, so they'll turn their head. But they'll be exotropic in primary gaze. If the innervation is roughly equal, they'll have a straight head and straight eyes. But you'll sti still see the co-contraction. Okay, does that make sense? I try to teach this in the way that like really makes sense. It's a springboard to learn the details. Um, and a, here's a child with type one left uh, Dwayne Center. I shouldn't look into this, right? Here you go. So his co-contraction of the medial and lateral rectus is, is really happening in adduction. And you can see his palpebral fissure is narrow, narrower here than here. Look at that photo. It's easier to show it in uh, up gaze and left here compared to here. But if you were standing to the side, getting a sagittal view of that eye, you would see the eye pull back in here. Okay? So that's, that's uh, what about this kid? He's a little exotropic, right? He's a little exotropic. And it, this doesn't show the head turn. This is type two. And check out his abduction's pretty good, but it's not normal compared to this side. And his adduction, I apologize. His adduction is reduced a bit. His abduction is pretty good, but maybe not perfectly normal. But look at the, the globe retraction when, he, when, he, uh, when his right eye goes into adduction. So this is type two Duane syndrome of his right eye. Does that make sense? Okay. And she has bilateral type 1 Duane syndrome. Watch this eye. Retraction, you can see narrowing of the palpebral fissure, and then whoa, it gets nice and big. Here, not that big a difference, but still an abduction deficit. Okay, so this can be bilateral. About 10, 15% of patients are bilateral. There are some other manifestations, an upshoot. Look at this. This is when the resident just comes over and says, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and um, so this happens, we think, because the lateral rectus is super tight. Not only getting innervation with adduction, but it's restricted and tight, and it acts as a leash on the globe. And the globe goes whoop. The lateral rectus kind of slides under the eye, and the eye goes up. And um, I'm going to talk about the surgery for that in a moment. Uh, a couple other sort of boards things that I don't really care if you know, but you need to know it for boards. Um, more common in females than males, bilateral in about 10, 15%. Usually it's sporadic. Autosomal dominant inheritance is reported in those mutations that I showed earlier are the case uh, are the research papers. 
It's been re reported in association with Golden Heart Syndrome, for sure. And that usually they don't have amblyopia and they have good stereopsis. Why? Why is that? Well, they like to use both, kids like to use both eyes together. So they turn their head to point both eyes straight instead of allowing strabismus. But what if they allow strabismus? Hang on to that thought. Uh-oh, amblyopia is gonna happen, right? Hang on to that thought. It's one of the indications for surgery for this. Uh, so, if a little kid starts to not want to turn their head anymore for their Duane syndrome and they're esotropic and they start to develop amblyopia, should you operate? Well, you got to do some amblyopia therapy first, right? Do a psychoplegic refraction, see if they need glasses for anisometropia, significant refractive error. Um, if you do all that and they're still esotropic, then you have to operate. So that's one indication for surgery. But, but what, if, what if they just turn their head? You know, why operate and when should you operate? Well, think it through. It kind of depends, okay? Depends on a, a few things. Well, first of all, you don't want to disrupt binocular visual development in the visual cortex. And isn't that amazing how that happens? Did you know there are ocular dominance columns in the primary visual cortex? Kind of like a pie. Take half a pie and make skinny slices all the way through the half of the pie. And each one of those slices is an ocular dominance column and they alternate right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye. And, and if you take a monkey and suture an eyelid shut at birth and then look at the histology four months later with one eye sutured shut, every other slice is gone. It's brain damage. Primary cortical visual development, that's, you know, gets disrupted by strabismus or suturing an eyelid shut, right? That's amblyopia. So you don't want that to happen, right? Um, so, so if you do surgery and, it, and, it, and it's not successful and you have to go back and operate again, that takes time. And during that time, there's no binocular visual experience you, and amblyopia is going to start creeping in. And what about stereopsis? Stereopsis is so cool. Imagine that pie with wires spanning over all those slices. Okay, so there are binocular neurons that had dendrites and axons that they, they span all those pie slices and connect them together. And that's depth perception. Okay, that, all, that develops during childhood, especially during the first two years of life. So you don't want to mess that up because we really want stereopsis, right? And uh, kind of like um, M&Ms, you only got one shot, right? You only got one shot at good stereopsis. My son listens to M&Ms. So. Uh, you don't want to disrupt that. So should you operate early on a kid with a head turn who has a normal binocular visual experience? No, 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 leave it alone, leave it alone. Don't operate right away. Just because a kid has a problem doesn't mean you should be operating, right? You want to think about the ultimate visual outcome. So I tend to wait. I wait as long as I can. Sometimes forever. But forever might be too long for a patient who's always turning their head. Why? Can you live with a head turn your whole life? What would you think of my lecture if I did this all the time? He'd probably say, I'm having trouble concentrating. I keep noticing that he turns his head all the time, <laughs> right? So that can be cosmetically unacceptable, but even worse, you can get chronic arthritis and highly, uh, chronic arthritis and, and, and neuro, uh, changes in uh, uh, facial asymmetry. And so, you know, in the long term, after binocular visual development has happened in a child with a head turn, you can, you can operate and start to help that head turn. Um, I like to wait at least until three or four years of age for binocular visual development, and then after that, I like to get a good exam, and so it's up to the level of cooperation of the kid. So for me, beyond four years of age, and it depends too. There's some, some other reasons that I'll, I'll delay. Um, and the surgeries for this, generally recessing muscles, restricted muscles is the way to go to help with the abnormal head position. So for example, a type one, Duane syndrome with an esotropic eye, 
recessing the media rectus will help midline the eye. It's not gonna help the eye abduct at all. And in fact, the price of doing that surgery is poorer adduction than you had preoperatively, but the eye's midline and the head's straight. So if you've prevented the arthritis and the facial asymmetry. Um, there is another approach, those, uh, uh, Arthur Rosenbaum passed away, but uh, he pioneered vertical transposition of the vertical recti to the lateral rectus to try to not only midline the eye, but also improve abduction. And um, that's where the dragons are lying and waiting. <laughs> because um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that and then tell a quick anecdote. Um, um, even after doing this for 20 years, my stress level goes very high when I'm doing transpositions of vertical recti because of induced torsion and induced vertical deviations and not getting the balance right, not getting the eye midline afterwards, and your reoperate goes up. It's just a part of it. <coughs> and you have to reoperate quickly before scar sets in typically. You gotta take them right back to the operating room, okay? And here's the anecdote. So I found that as you get older, the bad things and the harder cases get referred to you. It's just a natural progression of, of things. And uh, so child had this relatively new procedure in the hands of someone who probably didn't have the skill level to make it happen had a, a very large vertical deviation, did not reoperate right away, referred to me three months later, and I said, crap, bigger than I am, that one. So I referred them down to Arthur Rosenbaum, the person who pioneered this procedure. He actually had stopped operating by then, but uh, a doctor named Dr. Velez, one of the partners, took that on. Five, I think it was five surgeries later, uh, she had straight eyes looking straight ahead but couldn't move that eye in or out, up or down very far. So it was, it was just like, so um, don't think of, uh, think of the, what's the name of the song my son listens to from Eminem? Just got one shot. What's the name of the song? The Eight Mile Song. Is that what it's called, The Eight Mile Song? Well, I don't know the name of it. It stands for the movie Eight Mile. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay, thanks. You know what I'm talking about, just got one shot. And then it's like this big emotional thing. <laughs> he loves that. Uh, but that's kind of true for uh, transposition procedures. You know, they can be reversed, but it's it's it is a really big deal. So anyway, I still like a recession of a horizontal recti for Duane syndrome to achieve the limited uh, limited results of a straight head and binocular vision looking straight ahead. Um, okay. So the next entity is monocular elevation deficiency. Ooh, doesn't tell you a thing about the pathophysiology, that name, right? What? Oh dear, how do I teach this? <laughs> so uh, vertical deviation in little kids, pretty much you've got fourth cranial nerve paresis, Brown syndrome, monocular elevation deficiency, very rare inferior oblique paresis, and by the way, that fourth cranial nerve paresis that I want to talk to you about a different lecture, um, that can even present with the child fixing with the palsied eye and the other eye down, which <coughs> confuses the heck out of the diagnosis. And then you get this little toddler who won't hold still, and you can't sort it all out. It's really frustrating. And uh, what's fascinating is all the entities have a known pathophysiology except this one. We don't understand the under, underlying cause of an inability to elevate the eye Midline, in adduction, and in abduction. Okay, so like what we like to say is across the board that I can't go up. All the way across, can't go up. With Brown syndrome, right, they can't go up looking towards the nose, but they can in abduction so to distinguish it from Brown syndrome, okay? Um, it can be accompanied by true ptosis, but that's kind of hard to tell when the eye's down because the lid follows the eye because of you know, the fascial connections between the levator and the superior rectus, right? 
So these kids have to be helped with surgery before you figure out if they have true ptosis or not. This is the so-called pseudotosis. Um, and uh, really, there are two types. There's restrictive MED and paretic. And restrictive MED, it just means when you go to the operating room and do four ductions. Now, for those who don't know, four ductions is you got a, a patient under general anesthesia. There's no, little or no innervation to the extraocular muscles. And you hold onto the eye and move it around. Okay? And if a muscle is tight, like a leash on a dog, you know, the dog's running, you're low. Okay? When you move the eye, you can't, you, you feel restriction. It feels tight. Okay? And with restrictive MED, the inferior rectus feels tight in the operating room. And if you assess that in these, these kids, um, they uh, do well. But there's a paretic type uh, where a NAP procedure, transposition of the horizontal recti, is helpful. Well, anyway, let me get back to basics with MED. They have a hypotropia on the affected side. They tend to have a chin-up abnormal head position, not always. Kind of like Duane syndrome, right? Kids like to use both eyes together. So they're like, oh, wait, I want to use both eyes together, right? And uh, so I wait, I wait, I wait. The pie slices are forming. The connections between the slices are forming. I wait, I wait, right? And then eventually operate. But some kids are like, I can't keep doing this. And they just allow the hypotropia, okay? And, and so you ha then they'll develop amblyopia. You have to treat the amblyopia. Um, and uh, glasses, if they need it, always do a cycloplegic refraction in kids looking for anisometropia. Um, so I'll just touch on the nap transposition. That's just taking the horizontal recti, the medial rectus, and the lateral rectus and moving them up towards the insertion of the superior rectus, and it gives an elevating force to the eye for paretic MED. This is what it looks like. Can you guys see what's going on? This side can go down, but it doesn't go up. It doesn't go up here. It doesn't go up in abduction. Midline, it doesn't go up. Okay. All right, so there's another entity that stops the eye from going up. Now we're moving to Brown syndrome. Uh, oh dear. Antennas and cell phones are internal. When I grew up, antennas were really cool. My mom had a Buick Electra 225. It had a couch in the front. And she drove it, and the three kids were next to her, not in seat belts with lots of sharp things on the dashboard. And that car, it had a telescoping antenna that was automatic. This was the era of great auto design, if you ask me. You'd hit a button, and it would just go zzz, 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 zzz. And you know how those antennas work, right? They telescope out, click, 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 click. Well, it turns out the superior bleak tendons like that when it goes through the truck layer. Isn't that cool? I think that's really cool. So, you know, we used to think that this tendon was sort of like a rope going through a pulley. And Brown syndrome was there's a knot in the rope, bang. Okay. It's, it's the, Helveston studied this in cadavers and, and uh, it's pretty neat. So there's, right in the center, there, there are tendon fibers with, you know, scant adhesions to neighboring fibers, kind of like the, the innermost, smallest diameter part of the antenna. And that goes back and forth through the trochlea. And all the layers surrounding it are elastic, and they allow it to go back and forth, but they stop it from going too far. Does that make sense? So when, this, when the superior oblique contracts, right, it's the intorting down and out muscle, right, has mainly intorsion, depression, abduction. Um, so when it contracts, the tendon has to go, on my left eye, the tendon has to go this way through the trochlea, right? In this direction. And when the inferior oblique contracts, the superior oblique has to relax. So the tendon has to go back the other direction. Because if my left eye is going up and the obliques like this, 
It's got to do this. Does that make sense? It's got to do this. If the eye, right? Does everyone know their anatomy? It's pretty complicated. What happens with Brown syndrome is that the telescoping antenna doesn't work in elevation, but it works in down gaze. So maybe that knot in the rope analogy does help a bit. There's a knot in the rope behind the trochlea, so it can't elevate the eye. The eye can't elevate. It's restricted, like a leash on a dog. All the elevators pull up, the eye can't go. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, now these kids, uh, I'd rather just show you photos. So these, do, do kids like to use both eyes together? Uh-huh, uh-huh, right? They like to use both eyes together. And uh, so look, his eyes look pretty straight here, but look, he's looking up and to the left. This eye can't go up. So he's got Brown syndrome right here. So he's going to want to keep that eye away from adduction, right? And that's what he does. He's got a left head turn. Does that make sense? So he gets that eye out of the direction where his eye misalignment happens. And he can't elevate the eye in adduction. This eye looks good, good elevation. And look, superior oblique works in depression. So that's Brown syndrome. And uh, why does it happen? What the heck, what, what's going on? Well, you can have a congenital abnormality of the superior oblique tendon trochlea complex. And just like that kid that I just showed you, but it can be acquired. You, here's, you can give someone Brown syndrome by doing orbital surgery. Is the swan incision? Is that what it is? I think so. That can happen. So you can give someone Brown syndrome with that. Um, or just orbital trauma. Poor, you know, guy in a car, motorcycle or something. Wham! They end up with Brown syndrome because of scarring at the trochlea. Even inflammatory diseases can cause uh, troubles right up here. Okay, and uh, here's the cool thing. You'll see this at some point in your career, hopefully. Some patients have a knot in the rope that stops the eye from going up, but it's a little knot. It's a small knot. And if they pull hard enough, it goes through. And they feel and even hear this click and their eye goes up. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and um, what's interesting in cases of inflammatory acquired Brown syndrome, Steroid injections in that area can help reduce inflammation and the clicking gets better and they can move their eye better. Okay. So Brown syndrome is just a description of some kind of trouble here that can be congenital or acquired. So whether you do surgery for Brown syndrome, well, you know, it has to be a permanent situation, right? You don't want to do surgery for something that's temporary, for goodness sakes, right? So the acquired cases generally are not treated surgically unless they're chronic. Um, and obviously from orbital surgery, orbital trauma, that's probably not gonna get better, you know, but the inflammatory ones can, so you can read about it. Don't jump straight to surgery, okay? Um, oh, okay, so let's talk. You're hearing the same theme again. It's gonna get boring, but you won't forget it. Leave them alone when they're kids. Leave them alone, let them turn their head. They'll develop binocular vision. I think the earliest I've operated on kids for Brown syndrome is five, six years of age, uh, if they adopt an abnormal head position, okay? But I've operated earlier, why? Why did I operate in a two-year-old with Brown syndrome? Because they were like, ah, I don't care. I'm gonna let my eye go down and they developed amblyopia and we had to move, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. What's the surgery? Well, doing some sort of weakening procedure on the superior oblique tendon uh, at the side of the globe you know, not in the orbit, you can't get back there, right? 
but you can get at the tendon with uh, in uh, subtenon space. So that's where we operate. And all the procedures are to lengthen or, well, cut the tendon in half. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of approaches to it. A complete tenotomy of the superior oblique tendon is a good approach. It, um, you just let the tendon fly, okay? And there are fascial attachments that surround the tendon and they tend to keep the tendon someplace close together, but it's not quantitated. And, it, and, in, and in that instance, the chance of a superior oblique paresis is, is significant, as high as 50% even in some series, but as low as 10 in others. You do the math. Maybe the patients with uh, the overcorrection saw a different doctor. Uh, and so I've, I've, although I didn't train this way, I started to do a quantitative weakening of the superior oblique with first silicone spacers. You know the retina, retina folks? They use those bands, silicone bands. You just cut one. Cut one to five millimeters, put some suture in it, sew it on the tendon. Um, Ken Wright was the one that started that. And, uh, but they can erode through the conjunctiva Stopped doing that. Only did a few of those and went to just using suture, just using Merceline suture. And uh, the reason I like this is it can be quantitated in the operating room where you can check your force ductions based on how far you've separated the tendon. And if it's too much, you can reverse it. If it's not enough, you can let it out a bit and try to equalize the force ductions between the two eyes. And my results of that have been really nice. I've been really happy. My reoperate operate is pretty low. Um, and this is the kid pre-op. Look here. Here he is post-op. So he's like way better. And he's, he, he does not have a terrible superior oblique paresis. He does have some paresis here. Uh, okay. I'm gonna to touch on adults, myasthenia, variable ptosis and, and variable double vision. As you know, this can be purely ocular or systemic disease of the neuromyal junction. You know the testing, I'll let the neuro-ophthalmologists go into that. And, um, but we see them if their diplopia is persistent. This is the ice test. This is before the ice, that's after the ice. Nice. <laughs> you know, I, I think I was uh, a fellow when the ice test was, was uh, discovered. Shazam. <laughs> I just think that's great. I, I like really simple things in the clinic to make a diagnosis. I just love that. Thyroid eye disease. You guys know what this is about, right? Orbital inflammation of connective tissue and extraocular muscles with replacement of muscle tissue with glycosaminoglycans. The muscles get super tight and start pulling the eyes in bad directions. The uh, severity of muscles affected tends to go in this order. Inferior rectus is the worst, medial rectus is second worst. So these patients usually end up with a hypotropia and an esotropia, right? But the superior rectus, the lateral rectus can be affected, and the superior oblique can be affected too. Um, and, uh, but usually, they look like this, okay? Like that. She has an incredibly tight inferior rectus on this side, and it's tight on this side as well. <coughs> Here's your CT, oh dear, look at that. Might need an orbital decompression. It's possible in that patient, that's for sure. Um, so eye muscle surgery for their diplopia. You can never make them normal. Just can't make them normal, okay? Their muscles are replaced by fibrous tissue. But you can try to get as large an island of single binocular vision looking straight ahead and in down gaze for driving and reading. That's really what you shoot for. These patients are so happy. Um, even if they're, you can't restore rotations of the eyes. And uh, here's the teaching point for boards and in, in your practice if you do this. Julian. Uh, 
recessions, not resections, with rare exceptions to that rule. Okay, you gotta recess. If, what happens if you res resect a restricted muscle? It's more restricted, right? So you, you, you end up like inducing Duane syndrome if you resect with thyroid disease. But there, but there are some exceptions. Um, I'll just touch on blowout fracture. Okay, so do patients have double vision after blowout fracture, adults and kids? And the answer is, yep, absolutely they do. What's the main pathophysiology of double vision acutely right after a fracture for the first week or two? It's edema, hemorrhage into the orbital fascial tissues and the muscles. And that can resolve over time. And so you can't jump straight to orbital surgery or eye muscle surgery for these patients with one exception, and that's kids with a green stick fracture with the inferior rectus entrapped. That ain't getting better. <laughs> okay, that's not gonna get better. And, and they need surgery. And what's really interesting, does anyone know what the oculocardiac reflex is? I cause it all the time. Does anyone, do you guys know what it is yet? I see unfamiliar faces. You guys aren't nodding, so I assume no. If you pull on an extraocular muscle, the heart rate goes down. We see that all the time in the operating room with eye muscle surgery. Okay? It's a reflex. And it kind of makes sense. If you have a kid in the ER, let's say they have a pulse ox on something to monitor their heart rate, have them look up, and the unaffected eye will go up, the other eye won't go up, and their heart rate will start to drop because there's tension on that muscle. Okay, and that should, that should tip you off. It's sort of like the ice test. I mean, you, you can say the heart rate just went down when he looked up, he probably needs surgery. He certainly needs a CT scan. Okay, this is what it looks like. Here's an eye that can't go up. There's the green stick fracture in a kid. Okay, now it's, it's kind of a big deal to get it done sooner rather than later because muscles can become uh, ischemic when they're trapped in bone in kids. And then after you lift the muscle out, uh, they develop not a hypotropia, a hypertropia, because they have a paretic inferior rectus. Okay? Um, so orbital surgery, wait at first, except for the indications for immediate surgery from oculoplastics, and I'll let them talk to you about that. Usually it has to do with gigantic floor fractures with obvious enophthalmos that can only get worse as edema and hemorrhage subside. They'll repair early. There's some other indications, but I won't, I won't talk, I won't steal their thunder. Um, and uh, once, if there's entrapment, if the orbital surgeons do their job, then, then we're dealing with double, we can be dealing with double vision that's both restrictive and paretic. And with a restrictive disease, generally you're recessing muscles to reduce restriction. And with paretic disease, you're either doing a resection of a muscle, if there is some muscle function but not normal, or transposition if it's a dead muscle that doesn't pull, just like six granular paresis. Okay, I'll stop there. It's time to stop. Thank you. Any questions?